All right. Hi, everyone, and welcome back to Learning Impact 2021. Congratulations, you've made it to our closing session. I hope you've enjoyed the, uh, the great sessions so far. And if you haven't had a chance to see all of them, which of course you couldn't because they're, <laughs> they're going on at the same time, you can go back and review any or all of the recordings at your leisure. Um, during this final panel, uh, we're here to exchange insights on what to me is the penultimate challenge for educational systems around the world. Uh, we've called the panel Defining the Next Generation of Student Success, Equity, Agency, and Mastery in a Complex World. I suppose we could have just called it How to Get Better or something like that, but we, but we chose to frame this discussion as Defining the Next Generation because it's really a discussion about what our educational systems need to do, if I might say, to catch up and keep up with a changing world, which we all see is changing very rapidly. So um, now the reason I say it's the penultimate session is because really the goals of this type of transformation will, are really what we use to drive all the work we do in IMS to enable the technology ecosystems that we need to help achieve this, these goals. So to explore this topic, we have an all-star panel representing K-12 and higher ed, and in some cases both, um, all, all of these individuals are, are my heroes for being leading lights in terms of thinking on big issues such as the, the one before us. So I'd like to start off by introducing our panelists one by one. First, we have uh, Tom Arnett, who's the Senior Research Fellow for Education at the Clayton Christensen Institute. Hi, Tom. Hello. Thanks, Rob. Thank you. Um, next, we have Dr. Robin Johnston, who's the Chief Learning Officer at Nexford University. Hi, Robin. Hi there, everybody. Third, we have Louis Soares, who's the Chief Learning and Innovation Officer for the American Council on Education. Hi, Louis. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. And finally, we have Dr. Hiller Spires, who's the Associate Dean for the College of Education at North Carolina State University and the executive director at the Friday Institute. Hi, Hiller, how are you doing? I'm great. Hello, everyone. All right, panelists. So, um, and I'll mention uh, off the top here that uh, we will be monitoring the uh, chat um, as well and the Q&A if you want to post something there. I don't know if we'll have time to squeeze it in, but we will be watching. If you ask a good question, we'll try to uh, get it in here somewhere. All right, so we have a series of questions to kick this off, which is really kind of talking about student success today, how we might define it, and then what are some of the blockers, and then where are we going with the evolution of student success? And um, I have heard from some education officials, obviously student success is a, the most important thing in education, um, but perhaps this has become now a buzzword and perhaps of a, an overused term. Everything, every vendor and supplier out there is doing something to help students' success and so forth. So, so the meaning, because it's maybe a bit overused, the meaning is very, I think, probably open to interpretation. And so I'd like to ask you experts how you might define student success as, it, as it's talked about today. Who would like to go first? Well, I'll I'm happy start to dive off. in. Okay, go ahead. Go, ahead. go, go for it, Lewis. <laughs> Tom, was it Lewis or Tom? Was it a three-way tie? Uh, okay, okay, <laughs> Tom. I'm three-way tie. I'm gonna pick you, Tom. All right, go for it. Well, so I, I guess I, on that question of how do we define student success, I think it still means a lot of the things that it's meant in the past in terms of, you know, giving students um, access to lots of different learning opportunities in classrooms, um, making sure that students have, you know, adequate preparation and literacy and numeracy and sciences and, and social studies. But I think what's challenging today is that the definition needs to broaden. And that's what I think we'll get to a little bit later. That's what's challenging for school systems is that really what we need are school systems that can give students the access to both the experiences and the relationships that help them explore what it is out there that they could do with their lives and then put them on a track to pursue whatever whatever success or whatever goals and ambitions they have out there 
And I think real, really central to that, that sometimes runs counter to the culture that we have in education is really enabling their agency, um, not just treating them as inputs into a process that we add value to, but really helping them be in control of their own learning. Um, so I know that that is pretty high level, but I think that reframing is important that it's, it is lots of other things that it's been, but it's really access to opportunities and the agency to go pursue them. Okay, well, you've got us off to a good start there. Uh, I'm, 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 I'm not sure whether to pick Lewis to give us the higher ed uh, uh, look or Hiller because she kind of spans both worlds, but uh, which one of you would like to take a shot at following up Tom? I'll take a stab at it. Um, okay. I totally agree with what Tom just said, um, especially with this whole sense of agency. I think it's um, so important and also very challenging within especially the K-12 school system to create those contexts so that we have, uh, we are able to um, support student agency. And I think about <clears throat> um, how we define student success now during COVID and maybe how we defined it uh, prior to COVID because it's such a challenging time now. Sometimes student success is almost as simple as, okay, I was able to make it to class and I was able to um, virtually attend my class. And there are so many challenges that we're confronting right now. Mm -hmm. um, we obviously have had success, uh, our definitions of success in terms of um, districts and states uh, using standardized test scores, obviously. But I do think that we are fairly successful at reaching this agreement about the skill set that um, under, undergirds successful employment, especially in 2021. And I know that the, I believe it was the World Economic Forum came out with their top 10 skills and it was very much of what we have been used to in terms of 21st century skills, um, but also adding emotional intelligence, judgment and decision making, um, those kinds of skills that again, for a school system is very challenging to do what Tom said, which is make sure that you have this deep, rich content, but also broaden that lens so that you have these contexts where these other kinds of skills are evolving and they have opportunities to develop those. So I think that is our challenge. And we know that some schools um, and some districts seem to be able to do that better than others. And there are pockets of innovation all across the nation, all across the world. Um, and then there are other groups that are struggling to, to approximate those skills. Okay, so kind of in K-12, we're talking about a broadening out uh, perhaps from the reading, writing, and arithmetic, you know, the, 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 the rigorous uh, curriculum and so forth out to really kind of enabling personalized learning paths and agency for that. Let's maybe take a little, uh, ask uh, Lewis what he thinks uh, about the, this idea of how we're defining student success. Sure, terrific responses from Tom and Hiller. Uh, agree with most of what they said. I would add a few more perspectives and hope that it, it, it adds to the conversation. Um, you know, when re-establishing re a broad set of uh, metrics for the long-term value of higher ed for students, you know, it's yes, it's about the labor market, but it's about social outcomes and civic outcomes. And, you know, there's so much evidence that we need a rich civic culture now and uh, a, to deepen that part of our life as a na nation. And we, we have to find the room to reestablish those broader set of metrics as uh, defining student success. Um, related to that, how do we shape um, institutions, the, the tools that they use, especially in digital environments, to something you, you shared earlier, Rob, uh, into equitable spaces? What's the way that personal journeys and the journeys of organizations around um, equity and critical consciousness can shape uh, how we even define student success in a, in a more broadly understood way. And then the last one actually, and this one, this one doesn't fit as well, but for, it's, it's coming to my mind. It's been on my mind a lot lately that student success is, we should also think of it as a, does, um, uh, an action that when we do it, it changes institutional form, right? So that 
we're, we, we're trying a variety of things to help students be more successful. It's, and particularly digital tools allow us to do this in a variety of ways. How do we actually def, use that as a definitional architecture of whatever the education is? Is it a school? Is the unit of measure a school? Is it a district? Is it a college? Is it a system of colleges? How does student success drive the ongoing iteration and transformation of those things? So student, student success as institutional change, I guess, is my way to simplify that. Very interesting uh, idea there. Robin, how would you like to weigh in on this? Sure, and, and I agree um, with the others as well. And I, I think it's, it's also looking about how are we measuring student success? and looking are the measures and the outcomes actually what we need to define success. And, and the sense of agency or the sense of preparing students for lifelong learning or learning to learn is going to be so important to be successful now, but also in the future. As Hiller was talking about the 21st century skills, it's not only the 21st century skills, but it's adapting to the technological changes and the new innovations and creating an ecosystem for success. And what does that look like? And who are the individuals and the stakeholders in that? And how do we shift it for improvements in access, in equity, in learning design, in basically a learner-centric delivery model that integrates the technology that's needed now and in the future. Okay, so these are some, some really uh, great comments that create uh, a vision, I think, of, of where we, we need to go. I'm wondering, um, you know, sort of pragmatically speaking, if, if any of you would like to address the, the blockers, you know, what's keeping us from getting to where we are. I guess the pandemic obviously has been a bit of a <laughs> distraction, right? But, but maybe putting the pandemic aside uh, for a moment, maybe even thinking pre-pandemic or where we go from here. Um, or pandemic, if you'd like to talk about that as well, because the pandemic might have uh, might also have highlighted, you know, some some particular blockers as well. Um, how do we how do we move from where we are to perhaps where where each of you thinks we need to go? Well, I could jump in here um, and build on something that Robin said. Um, I think one of the blockers and one of the big blockers is um, our current system of standardized assessment. Um, you know, the way we assess both K-12 education and very often higher education doesn't fully account for or measure the kinds of learning that undergird those skills that students need for success and the ones that I mentioned previously. Um, so it's like, how do we have the imagination and the political will to really redesign systems of assessment that could align with these, these student-centered learning approaches? So I think that's one of the, the biggest challenges that we have. And um, I know, especially like for K-12, but it would be for higher ed as well, you know, we can't uh, continue to ignore the role that uh, racial discrimination plays within the educational system. It's, it's so important. And the research has confirmed that students do perform better when they have a teacher who looks like them. And so currently, you know, we have a real disconnect with that in terms, especially with K-12 education. Um, we have such uh, deep demographic shifts where we have more black and brown students but at least with K-12 and I think with also higher ed, you know, it's, it's a predominantly white, uh, a white uh, uh, teaching profession. Mm -hmm. So how do, we, how do we make these shifts so that we, have, we can deal with that particular block? So that's just two. I could go on, but I'll just throw those two out and see what folks have to say. Those are good. Uh, more blockers from others. Um, I, I can go and add a, a variant on that. We don't do a really good job of leveraging data in the teaching and learning process. Even when we have the technology tools to do it, we, we don't really complete that loop of the practice of teaching and the use of data that comes in digital environments from that teaching to inform what happens next, to create a cycle between formative assessment and su summative assessment um, in the post in post-secondary space, which I can speak most clearly to. Um, and I think 
that in higher ed, for sure, that is one of the great, it's a blocker, but one of the great areas of promise in the next couple of decades is data informed pedagogy. Um, not, not, making, not making pedagogy any less human, but simply using data to drive how we help people learn. Now, Thanks, play Liz. off of, of Lewis a little bit. And, and with the, the pedagogy, it's also thinking about where are the touch points for human interaction? And using that data for the touch points for success, because everybody is different. And we've created environments. It's, it's about the learning journey and how are we creating that journey and who's involved in that journey. And it's not just one person, the, the faculty or success advisor or however you're doing. It's a collaborative effort and really mm -hmm. looking at those things. The other aspect is the digital divide. We forget to think about just the lack of technology. We want to use technology, but then what about individuals in rural areas in the U.S.? I work predominantly with an international population and thinking about, you know, how do you frame the things that you want to do that would be engaging for student success, but we can't do it because the digital issues that come about. Okay. Thank you, Tom. So I'm gonna I'm gonna say something that may be a little bit controversial, which is I think often we look at the different parts of the education system that we need to make better, whether that be better assessments or better teacher pipelines or better data systems, and all of that is true and all of that is important. Um, but I think sometimes it misses the bigger picture. So let me paint an analogy real quick. I had a, a friend and a colleague once who talked about how he walked into his kitchen one day. And he found a pot of water boiling on, on the stove. And you know, he asked the question, like, why is this pot of water boiling here? Well, si um, physics gives us some great answers. Well, the water is boiling because there's a heat source and there's liquid and that liquid is getting heated and then it's turning from liquid to gas. Um, and so from that standpoint, you say, well, then you need to remove the heat source if you want the water to stop boiling. But the real cause of why the water is boiling is because his son came in to make macaroni and cheese put on water to boil and then walked away and forgot <laughs> while he was waiting for the water to boil, forgot about the macaroni and cheese he was making. And, and so there's really like, there's a, there's a broader context and a bigger system that our, that our particular solutions are, are a part of. And I think sometimes we miss that. So when I think of what are the bigger barriers, it's not that we need, you know, better solutions across all these components of our education system. I think we actually need to rethink some of the architecture of the education system. And rethinking the architecture uh, really isn't just about figuring out how to, what do we need to change or what do we need to make different, but how do we create the new space or circumstances where that new architecture can evolve? To, to tell another real quick story, um, you know, IBM is a company that's been around for a long time. Its business has evolved a lot over the years. So there's an interesting period in IBM's history where they had been, you know, the dominant producer of big mainframe computers. And then the PC emerged. And the way that IBM figured out how to compete in the PC market was not by taking its mainframes and figuring out how to reconfigure them and how to add features to them or change their form factor to sell them um, with, with all the benefits that a PC offered. They actually started a new business unit. Their main offices were in New York and they started this whole new business unit in Florida to go figure out how to do PCs. Now it wasn't because they you know, needed new expertise. They had all the right engineers, all the right talent for, for making PCs, but what they needed was a context where they were just under different pressures. Because I think what happens in K through 12 education is that you know, we, want all the, we want the system to improve and get better, but at the same time, um, the system we have exists the way it does because it solved problems in the past. And just adding more layers on top of what we expect people to do um, just makes the job of educators harder and harder. We've actually got to rethink some of our priorities. And that comes from rethinking, you know, what are the, you know, whether it's state policy or school boards or families, all these different stakeholders have expectations of the system. And we have to, I think, give education new spaces to, to figure out new priorities and new processes for doing what it does not just expect it to layer new processes on the existing system of stakeholders and priorities that those stakeholders expect of the system we have. 
Yeah, my sense is, uh, Tom, what you're pointing out there is that a barrier there is that, well, if we want to do more things, if we want to broaden the definition of success, how can we? Because we're maybe already struggling to meet the model that we, the old model we had within the time allotted. Uh, so sort of a mm -hmm. redesign uh, is required. So I, I'd like to, you know, the um, one of the key points that's been mentioned so far is this idea of the um, the skill sets, you know, the broadening of skill sets. You can call them skills if you want, competencies, what have you, um, um, areas that define success like uh, civic, civic minded, mindedness and so forth. How, do you know of any, how do you, can any of you address how we, how we think, whether in K-12 or higher ed, where we may already be starting to see enabling those broader skill sets? Is it possible? You know, uh, are there examples of success or if there are not, what comes to mind as ways to move from where we are today to tomorrow? Um, you know, maybe it's redesigning and particularly so, you know, in K-12, we have a more con sort of controlled, I'll just call it that with the state level input, right? Learning standards, things like that, right? So there's that sort of thing. Higher ed may be a little more flexibility about that. Uh, you know, in terms of how the higher institutions go about defining those skill sets. So, um, and maybe there's some interface between them, right? Because the students in K-12 are trying to go into higher ed. So what are, you, what are your thoughts on that? I mean, just take that one area of the broader skill sets and how, are, is there progress we're seeing or, or what would you recommend to be a starting point for progress? Well, I'll jump, um, you know, I think about one of the, um, approaches that we've been using for some time now, but that it just hasn't scaled is uh, project-based learning. And when it's done really well, it's amazing, you know, how it gets at all of these skills that we're talking about. And um, what, what we've seen is that when it is done well, um, and when, you know, a lot of the constraints within, especially K-12, are, are, are challenged because of problem-based learning, you know, you can get an incredible student learning, student-centered learning going on. Um, but what I'm always amazed at is how it's perplexing to me why it doesn't scale. You know, it's like you can, you can talk with um, educators and they, they have these definitions, they want to do these things, but when it comes down to it, there are so many challenges at the building level. And with that it prevents them from doing some of the basic kinds of moves that the, the pedagogical moves that the teachers need to make in order to bring about this kind of learning. So I, I'm all with you, Tom. I think there needs to be uh, like a major revisioning and, and creating new spaces where this innovation can grow and emerge. Um, and you know, there are pockets of this around. I mean, different um, groups are trying to have these accelerators, these learning accelerators come up and trying to remove the constraints. Um, but I always find it challenging because it's so hard to scale it, you know, because we have of the educational system we have, how do you scale it? And I, I kind of think about it as these series of pockets of innovation and how do you uh, kind of link them all because they're all unique and have, um, different kinds of um, uh, activities going on, um, but somehow we need to link them and get this powerful force for change going on. Is it is it just to follow up on that? Is it is it if really for anyone? But Hiller, if you want to take it, that's fine. You know, um, do we see the potential really though for state agencies? Really, you know, I think a lot of the K twelve uh, school districts are responding to you know the mandate from their their state, you know, from their, from their government, right? Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and it almost seems like, as Tom pointed out, that would need to change, that would need to broaden, that would need to, it would need to become necessary to achieve a quality K-12 education that you demonstrate proficiency at, at, in projects, as an example, or something, something along those lines. I'm, I'm out of my field here, but is that, is there any evidence that that maybe yeah, could happen? Think, or people, I, yeah? Well, I think it's the, the issue of um, this tension with standardization and innovation, right? Mm -hmm. It's like there's this need like that everyone gets what they need. I mean, that, that's really the issue is like we're trying to make things equitable. 
But then, and, and sometimes we try to do that through standardization, but it actually has a negative effect um, or a backwards effect. So I think there is the tension between standardization and innovation. And we've been, we've been uh, battling that for some time now. And I think we will into the future until we're ready to leap a little bit. Right. So, so, you know, Lewis, uh, and, and, you know, the, the invention of the land grant, you know, university, right, came, came about because there was a recognition that uh, there, there needed to be different types of institutions, you know, in higher ed that could teach more practical skills and so forth, but still be universe. I don't know. Is there something like that model that we, <laughs> that we need, uh, we need, I think, uh, or, or, and, or both for Robin or Lewis, are you seeing examples in higher ed where, this idea of the broader skill set is really starting to take shape in some way, shape, or form. So, just a, a few reflections that I hope are responsive to the question. And if I get excited, you can you can calm me down or mute me. So, um, higher ed ha has been on a, a long journey to understand that it needs to reblend what we would have considered career preparation education with traditional liberal arts education. And that's a journey that uh, I think we've been on for a while, that, uh, not before the land grants, but certainly at some point between then and now in the Morrill Act. So, and it's an ongoing journey. Examples of places that I can point to where it's happening in higher ed, that, uh, and I'll use examples that are very, very practical because I think that um, um, we're seeing a growing number of our, of our liberal arts college members. We're seeing that they're getting really sophisticated about, um, you know, okay, where are many of my graduates going when they leave me? But, you know, what are the metro areas they're going to? What are the skill sets that are in demand in those, in those areas? And they're actually working with um, labor market data companies to help them really target, like uh, the data analytics is important. So I'm gonna create a data analytics module for my history majors. So that way, when they go to Chicago and data analytics is an in-demand skill set, so they're complementing that practical labor market skill set. And we're seeing that it's a growing trend among liberal arts colleges. Another piece of the puzzle is the, the growing importance of experiential learning. Uh, we can, you can use a variety of indicators of this. The one that we mostly use is internships. Now that we typically have the dialogue about that in terms of that employers wanna kind of like kick the tires on the candidate before they hire them. But another component of it is the speed cycle of learning is happening so quickly that the, the experiential learning gives the student a way to um, take what they've been learning in the classroom setting, apply it and, and to, um, speed up that cycle time of learning. And then right. finally, and this remains uncharted territory, is the emergent space for learner-driven credential profiles, wallets, digital environments, you guys do this work. We're right now throwing a lot of competencies into those, into those wallets, right? That come from many, many different places. And how they, the, the learning science is clear that similar categories of knowledge don't necessarily cross context, right? Right, and so mm -hmm. we're throwing all that stuff in there. And I suspect looking at you know, there's gonna be a rich data set created that helps us understand how students blend learning across different areas of their life where they have to apply it. So hope that was helpful. Yeah, well, definitely was. Robin or Tom, would you like to make any add, comment on the site? How, I'll add examples? some in this. Yep. Yep. So in higher ed, there's a movement, if you will, going called the Open Skills Network that started out of WGU and others that have been doing it and, and other institutions um, have been skills focused. Higher ed has had this friction going on for quite a while between the workplace and higher ed, the employers and higher ed and employability. Are we actually teaching what needs, what skills are needed, not only for from the liberal arts perspective, but for employability perspective. And there's not been a common language, similar mm -hmm. to what Hiller is saying, it's hard to standardize when there's not a common language. So Open Skills Network is actually a conglomerate similar to CBEN and others, who is trying to help with this common language between 
the workplace, the employers and higher ed, because competencies have been tried, but skills are actually going to be the identifier. And to speak to Lewis, sorry, my dog is barking now. Um, <laughs> Somebody he likes it. He, like, he, he likes, likes what it. He's saying. so excited yeah. about the skills. Like, you know, I'm teaching yeah. him new skills. <laughs> um, but I, I think if we can create this common language, similar to IMS is going on the transcript to have a common language on a transcript that then can be seamless, but it's going to take a collective to do this. It's not, it starts K through 12, it's higher ed, it's employers, it's community. And I think that's where the challenge is. And if I think back to the 70s and the movement of competency-based education in the 70s and in the 80s or in other countries, it, the movement has started, but it hasn't kept moving. And we've kept it moving, I think, different times because you've gotten, the, as Thomas was saying, Tom was saying the, the government, the other agencies involved in it, you know, there's, there's more of a collective view of it. But I think it's it that ecosystem has to be developed holistically, and, mm -hmm. and that's going to be a challenge. And everybody needs to buy into it, and then you can develop these pockets of innovation a little bit differently. Yeah, well, thanks for that. We are we are IMS are definitely we're definitely collaborating with the Open Skills Network because uh, we we know so a lot. There's also in other countries there's things similar going on that that we're collaborating in. Tom, did you have any comments on that one or should we move to the next topic? I think I'll just share some quick kind of overarching comments, which is, you know, to, to, to just build on what Robin and Hiller have said and what Lewis has said is, I do think we need these new spaces and the key defining feature of those new spaces is they need to have different systemic pressures on them. They can't just be, you know, be accountable for delivering all the things that our existing systems have plus more. It's like they need um, you know, just different uh, different sets of incentives and stakeholder pressures that they're operating under to develop new models. And I think once they do that, you know, what I, I think there's a there's a, my optimistic side says if you can prove it in those contexts, then it makes it easier to create the shift in in more conventional spaces because uh, it's always easier to work from a proof of concept and help people adopt something that you've shown how to work than it is to just create something from scratch. Okay, thank you. Thank you, panelists, for, for all those comments so far. I wanted to hit hit the topic of the uh, the standardized testing or the high stakes testing a bit because that is definitely a topic that cuts across uh, uh, from K-12 to, to higher ed to some degree in the admissions side of things. And um, clearly there is a movement away from, <laughs> from standardized high stakes testing in terms of the requirements to get into college and, and so forth in various states uh, wanting to replace what they have with something else. But that's my really question to you. Well, if not high stakes testing, then what? What, what are we moving to? We're, we're moving from that to what? Our, a lot of our audience is probably very interested in hearing your thoughts on that. This may be, go ahead, Hiller. Go ahead. Oh, you, you go for it first and then I'll yeah. jump in. You know, I, I often, um, first just a um, little practical experience uh, or what passes for practical experience for someone, from someone who writes papers for a living, you know. Um, <laughs> um, you know, when in, in higher ed, and I, I believe there's a parallel in, um, in K-12, but I'm not sure if it's exact. You know, when we started leaning into competency-based education, you know, we, we almost use that phrase as, you know, it's a cure-all. We just say companies-based education and everything is going to get fixed. Right. And one of the, the, there's no evidence that the learning science, the way we do testing, the, it isn't quite there where we, we can implement this perfect assessment system. And, you know, um, uh, a colleague once said in a, in a meeting where we were discussing uh, the future of competency-based ed, you know, are we just going to create the competency-based version of the credit system we created with, with Carnegie units, right? And I think that it is, the, it is one of the frontiers, especially where our, our practice of, of understanding what students know and they're able to do, the ways we teach, 
and technology's ability to measure things, it feels still to me like a frontier that mm -hmm. we where a lot of people try to define that frontier based on their immediate interest right now, but it's not mm -hmm. fully defined yet. I don't know if my colleagues mm -hmm. agree, but I really feel like it's a future that we're each shaping right now based on our needs, but it hasn't quite formed yet, that assessment mm -hmm. future. Yeah, I, I agree with you. Um, and I think about the example of uh, micro credentials, which I am very supportive of and the Friday Institute um, has been a leader in that area. Um, but at the same time, when we're trying to do micro credentials, I think one of the reasons it hasn't taken off and scaled the way we thought it was going to scale is again, we have different uh, groups um, defining my credentials in different ways. And there's a lot of idios idiosyncratic approaches. So then here we are not doing the standardization thing, which while ago I said, you know, there's this tension between the innovation and the standardization. So on the one hand, it's almost like you can't do standardization um, if you want to do the innovation, or at least it seems that way. But then as soon as we try to do the standardization, say with the micro credentials, then it's almost like we lose something. So I think that's kind of this, um, uh, this sort of, uh, I don't even know what the right word is, but this uh, track that we're in right now, and we need, we need to figure out what the breakthrough is on that so that we can just come up with some new systems so that we're not, we don't have these old constraints that we keep pulling up as we try to do these new models. And I feel like that's really what's happening a lot of times. Mm -hmm. And who, who's, but who would drive the, the idea of, of standardizing, uh, say an area like micro credentials, right? So much potential, right? Because it has the mm -hmm. ability to break down what somebody knows or learned or even what their achievements were, or their experiences are and represent them. I think that's a, it's a, it's one of the questions we, we we sort of have to kind of grapple with, with which is mm -hmm. where is the drive for change coming from, right? And I'd just be interested to hear the panel's thoughts on on that um, because all of these ideas are awesome ideas and we're they're going to happen, right? But they're probably going to happen in order where there's more motivation for them to happen in some way, shape, or form, even if it is for some sort of shorter term, um, you know, reason. Um, yeah, kind of theory of change kind of stuff. Anybody thoughts? Is this consumer, for instance, is this going to be consumer driven? Is this going to be driven by employers? Is this going to be driven by, um, uh, you, you know, the uh, leading associations in higher education, for example, or who who's going to, where is this drive or state governments or, you know, where is this drive going to change, going to come from? I think we all hope it would all come from all of those places, but where is it coming from now? I think some of it, a lot of it's coming from the employer, you know, the melding of the two together, you know, mm -hmm. focusing on one single language will drive some of this innovation forward. And I think understanding each other the key to understanding is really understanding what we're trying to either measure or analyze or use the data from, from that. If you think about the reskilling movement now, and, and I think about, we've got five generations in the workplace. That's a big driver of this because reskilling with micro credentials, someone has a degree, they've been working and they've been effective, but they need specific things, the data analytics, they may need computer skills, they may need something else, where a micro credential is a short term achievement, but it also gets the results that's needed immediately. So it's a win win for both. Mm -hmm. And I think that's part of the driver. Um, mm -hmm. Some of it is also driving is looking at building a growth mindset and lifelong learning and businesses and, and higher ed have realized that you don't stop at just a degree. And this is an avenue for people to keep lifelong learning till, till the end of life. And, it, and it's something, it's a retention initiative, it's a persistence initiative, it's a short-term achievement, and it, it, it's a skill imperative in many ways. Mm -hmm. And do you think, do you think Robin or, or Lewis, do you think that the higher education institutions might start looking also for these skills 
type of uh, these broader skills from the graduates of the school districts as they come into higher education, perhaps? Or is that is that a is that a just a wild idea that could never happen? Or because in theory, right, there's this in theory, there's a theory of change that says this higher education starts to um, uh, appreciate broader set of skills that the uh, the, the K-12 school districts will respond and the state leadership will respond. Any thoughts on that? So uh, a couple of observations. One is, you know, the the last year and kind of like the, um, the steps away from uh, the SAT and the ACT, th those, that's in some ways the market making immediate choices about that, whether mm -hmm. there's uh, another way of understanding um, students in the long term is has has it has to do with values, uh, the 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 cost of understanding students in other ways, and all those things. Uh, I would suggest that the driver there is going to be uh, look look to places in the South where the demographics have already turned, and how they're handling that or not, mm -hmm. because that's the driver, right? Um, in higher ed, more broadly. The experience that I think is is interesting. Some of it's because it's uh, you know I, this another area of my research on adult students, but also um, it's a place where colleges have different ways of understanding students. So um, in the area where you, you know you're an institution that largely serves uh, older students or a continuing ed shop of an existing university, credit for prior learning has been a tool for identifying and onboarding different kinds of students for a long time. It's not scaled. There, we need better research on it. Um, and that both the research is growing and also the use of it is growing. Some of that is driven by the market, right? You're, it's, you're competing with more and more students that uh, uh, more and more colleges that are trying to, to access those students. But part of it is driven by a growing understanding that, hey, you know, if this person has this um, skills profile coming from that work environment, I actually can map it to some of my internal credits and they're likely to persist at a higher level. The most recent research suggests that. And so, and I only use that as an example of a place where higher ed does use different ways of understanding the students that are coming to them. That's, that's a one narrow segment of the market, but on that bridge and Kate, I, I'm, I'm not gonna be the expert on K-12, but I, I think looking in the places where we've had those democratic shifts already and where they are trying different demographic shifts already and where they are trying different stuff is where you're gonna see the appetite of districts for making that kind of change. Mm -hmm. Tom, you know, uh, Clayton Christian Institute, not to put you on the spot, but I will, but Clayton Christian Institute, you're right big on theory of series of change, right? You know, the innovator's dilemma, right? The whole, that whole thing. I'm just wondering what you, and you're on mute now, but I'm just wondering what you might be thinking about all of this. You know, what's the theory of change on how we make these gears, you know, move? Do you, do you have any, have you had any thoughts on that? Yeah, well, listening to the comments from the other panelists, my head's been racing, trying to, trying to think through some of these problems. Um, let me start here. Um, one of the the nature of, I think, kind of the general thing we can say about all these problems is that they involve an interface between different parts of the education system, whether it's between higher ed and K through 12, um, you know, between teacher preparation programs and schools for micro credentials. Um, and, and so in that, those are with those interfaces, um, Clayton Christensen developed a framework for making sense of when will those types of interfaces work? And he, he identified three conditions. You have to have specifiability. You have to be able to say like, how, what's the exchange we're making here? How do I make sure that I make my piece right? So that when I hand it off to you, it fits right into where you're, where you expect it to plug in. Um, you have to, so you have to write specifications or standardize things like Hiller was describing. Um, but where that tension that Hiller talked about between innovation and standardization shows up is that, um, in order for that interface to actually work well, it's not just having the right standards. It's also getting, uh, being able to verify that the standards are met um, and getting predictable performance. Once the standard has been set and verified that the result you get is actually what you wanted. And getting to that last part, that predictable, you know, where the interaction is predictable 
it mm -hmm. takes time and it takes trial and error and it takes tinkering and getting things to work. Um, in education, I think we're really good at setting the standards on the front end, but just because we write the standards doesn't mean that it gets to you know, that, predictable, that predictability that we need in order for the standards to really work well. But when we lock in on a standard, it, it constrains our ability to keep tinkering to get to that predictability. So, mm -hmm. so how do we get there? I think um, one is sometimes it requires creating across those pieces. So I was talking to a colleague who does work in healthcare about doing value-based healthcare, where you know, where in value-based healthcare, the idea is that um, the healthcare provider their incentive is to keep you well. Because right now, the way our system works is that they bill for every time you visit the doctor and for every service they provide. So they make more money the more often they see you and the more procedures they do, um, not based on that they, they actually keep you well. And mm -hmm. so, but, but the challenge is doing that value-based healthcare, it's not just a matter of changing the philosophy of a healthcare system. You actually need to line the incentives, which usually means you need something like a UPMC in Pittsburgh or a Kaiser here in California that is both the, the insurance provider and the healthcare provider where the incentives line up to actually do both. And I think when you, when you bridge like that across an interface, it gives the organization more of the ability to tinker with those standards um, internally until they can get them right. And once they figure out how to do them well, then you can kind of break that interface apart again and have lots of different providers that all use that interface. But figuring out how to get it well usually requires that kind of integration. So I, I'm not sure what exactly that looks like in, in education, but I imagine it could be something like, you know, teacher prep programs that also run K through 12 schools, where mm -hmm. they're ensuring that the teachers they're training actually can operate effectively in the schools they're running. Um, or maybe it's, you know, integration where you have higher ed institutions that are also running secondary schools and figuring out, well, what is it? How do we measure and how do we design the secondary experience so that when students get to the higher ed experience, it's working well? Um, so I think that's one thing is that, it, that integration, it can happen without that, but it just, it's, it's a lot slower uh, because of that tension between standardization and, and innovation. It's a lot slower if you don't have that integration. The other piece is we just need spaces where the stakes are lower. If you're trying to replace an old, uh, an old standard with a new standard, out of the gate, that new standard has to be better than the old standard. Mm -hmm. But if you can find a place where the old standard doesn't exist or doesn't work at all, it kind of lets you start and, and tinker over time. And this, this ties a little bit to our, our research on disruptive innovations. People think of disruptive innovation as this big breakthrough, but often disruptive innovations start off as really crummy, but they start off serving people who don't have access to the conventional solution, and then they improve over time. And once they improve over time, that's when the disruption happens, when the whole sector changes. But people often forget about that early stage that the disruptive innovation didn't just, you know, wasn't just conceived out of nothing better than the existing system. It actually started off in a, in a really crummy state and had to go through its own improvement in a space that wasn't expecting it out of the gate to be better than what we already had. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you, Tom. I, I, uh, we're going to have to end there. We actually went a few minutes over, but it was worth it. Uh, about to, that. No, no, it was worth <laughs> it. To, to, it was worth it to catch that framework there at the end. I knew you could be probably the best one to come up with something like that. So, Hey, thank you, panel. This was a, an awesome discussion, and, and I'd love to have it again sometime and, and, uh, and continue it, and I'm sure we'll be able to do that. But thank you so much for taking the time to be with us, and uh, I really appreciate it. And to all the viewers out there, we really appreciate you tuning in to being part of the Learning Impact 2021 uh, conference. I'm sure many of you participated in many ways in the conference, and I really can't thank you enough for supporting uh, the mission of IMS and what we're trying to do over here. So take care, everybody. We'll see you soon.